Hey, welcome to the MMA Prospectus. It's me, Zane Simon, joined by my co-host, Tom Grant, here to talk prospects, scouting, prospect scouting, scouting fighters, fighter scouting, all watching, that kind of stuff. Watching lots of regional fights. That's yeah. that. That is the essence of what we're doing. Watching lots of regional fights, looking at a lot of regional fight cards, trying to figure out who to watch, and frankly, watching... <laughs> Watching out for the bottom end of the UFC cards and seeing, ah, like a hair in my mouth. Jesus, who's coming up on? God who's coming damn. up on the UFC cards deep down and buried where nobody cares and nobody's paying attention? Except us. That's why we're here, and we've got a big week of prospects. What well, we don't we don't really have a big week of UFC prospects ahead, so we're probably going to start out focusing back. But there's a, a pretty solid week outside the UFC to talk about. And uh, we'll dive into next week's UFC too. But first and foremost, we should jump back to this UFC Vegas card because obviously there was quite a lot of moving and shaking going on on that oh, card. <laughs> um, mostly with the Bantamweight division. And very obviously the prospect of the moment is Cody Garbrandt. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, the prospects generally speaking on this card didn't fare super well. Um, uh, yeah, Cody Garbrandt looked like the guy, I mean we talked about last time like he was either the guy that either is going to be an absolute killer or is just one that like is going to tantalize us for the rest of his career <laughs> and he looked like the killer last night. He looked sharp. Uh, a lot of fundamental pieces in his boxing game kind of seemed to come together. And it was just a really good matchup in the sense that uh, Thomas Almeida, while a really good striker, usually takes like a half a round to a round to really get in his groove. And up until that point, he's not really the most defensively sound fighter. And Cody Garbrandt usually starts really fast and hits really fucking hard. So... Those two things met, and it led to Thomas Almeida being iced. Well, and I mean, Thomas Almeida may start slow, but he, like, he may not be the best fighter early, but he doesn't actually start slow, which also helps Garbrandt's case a lot. It's that, you know, Almeida's the kind of fighter that he tends to charge it like he tends to get hurt early in every fight it's not just like oh he's staying outside and staying away he's kind of got that pro like the the donald cerrone problem classically or what was cerrone's problem for a long time uh where is like not only are you like not it's taking him time to catch up but while he's catching up he's still very engaged offensively which means that he's really open to being hit um I honestly still, like, I'm still quite, sh totally shocked by Garbrandt's win. I'm not going to say that in hindsight, I thought, you know, I can see how obvious it was that it would be different than that. Garbrandt has never that, to me at least, looked that sharp a fighter, that consistent a fighter offensively uh, or defensively. And mm -hmm. he really looks like he's just taking a big lead. That's, to, for me, that's always one of the hardest parts about trying to scout all these guys. And it's fun to see a lot of them on the same card at the same time, people that we've tracked and especially in the same division who are relatively like they all rel Garbrandt, Almeida and Sterling all started right around the same point in their career. Mm -hmm. So they're all really very much in the same place. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see them all at once because it really shows like you never know who's going to take some huge leap that you didn't expect. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing. And like you said, you just you never know who's gonna be who or when it's gonna be where they're gonna take a big leap forward. Where they come in like, oh man, like that's a totally different fighter in terms of like how he's how he's using his hands and how he's setting up his punches. Looks completely different than the guy I watched like four or five months ago fight, you know. And it's it's fun to see when it happens. And Garbrandt took that big jump. Almeida didn't. And Garbrandt just has for 135. He has ridiculous power. His not he doesn't have like clean knockout power. When he knocks guys out, like the way he comes into fights and the way guys go down, it doesn't look like he's knocking them out. It looks like the referee is stopping the early stages of murder. Like <laughs> it's just it's absolutely brutal when he hits people. Yeah, well, he's got that great classic combination of hand speed and accuracy, which I mean, 
if you ha- if you have those two things, you don't even necessarily have to be that powerful a guy. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you're punching re- really fast and really clean and landing really clean. Um, you know, beyond that, I think, yeah, he does have great power. He's got, uh, I believe, a pretty long reach for his height. Uh, actually, let me see. What's 68 inches in feet and inches is five foot eight. He doesn't have a long reach for his height. Never mind. Whatever. It seems like he does. It seems like he's got big arms, but maybe he doesn't. Um, he definitely has the hand speed, though. He lands clean. And he's really putting together a much better combination striking game. And as he's doing that, it's just going to make him more and more dangerous. Yep. So, yeah, Gar- Garbrandt obviously came out looking great. Almeida uh, had a rough night. Almeida had a terrible night. Yeah. Almeida, um, he, you know, he hit, he hit Garbrandt clean a few times. Like, he didn't look totally awful. He was going offensively, uh, and he was just getting hit. And that's this the is, problem. <laughs> this is probably a wake up that Almeida may have badly needed. Yeah. It, at some point, somebody wasn't just going to hurt him. They were going to put him away because he's really been relying on his ability to recover from getting dropped and hurt in almost every fight. And so, you know, ho- hopefully he comes back from this and figures out what the next you know step defensively needs to be or offensively what he needs to mix into his game and how he can do it uh to become a better more complete elite fighter and competitive fighter competitive and elite level the bigger problem to me is or the bigger concern to me is honestly aljamain sterling yeah that was a rough one uh sterling looked good in the first round got his work done and then got tired uh, Caraway made some good adjustments. Caraway grabbed the fence a couple times and then started yeah. working. I, I think for me it was more of Caraway started becoming the more active wrestler. He started actually shooting in on Sterling yeah. and putting Sterling, and Sterling did not look comfortable on his butt at all. Um, like against the fence, against the fence on his butt, like Sterling like looked at a loss at what to do. I, I don't even know that that was it. I mean, because Brian Caraway is really really good at swarming and maintaining position Mm -hmm. and just like you know every time sterling would try to posture to get up in one direction caraway would put pressure to to uh, compromise his core in that direction and sterling would then have to shift to another direction and caraway would adjust to that and keep sterling down i think the biggest problem to me is that he's reached sterling's reached a point where and, and this is not to say something that's going to be like, oh my God, he can't fix this or it'll always be this awful thing. But he's reached a point where it seems like he's not getting better at what he's bad at. Mm-hmm. And those things are becoming big problems against fighters who are no longer just going to sit and watch him at range. Yeah, I mean, his biggest problems are a, his striking game, like just generally speaking, he is not comfortable in the pocket. He doesn't like being in punching range. He likes the throw kicks. And this is what Caraway kind of identified uh, when he said that like Sterling doesn't like to get hit. And yeah. uh, actually, t- I was talking to, again, uh, um, one of the former co-host, Patrick Wyman, and he is openly talking about adding another category of prospect loss where dumbass kicks contribute to a loss. Uh, and yeah. and Sterling kind of being on the outside, just flipping up all these crazy kicks. I mean, I have to think that contributed to him slowing down later in yeah. the fight. A big, I think a big part of it is just that. I mean, you watched that fight, and every time Caraway or Sterling, I, you know, if it when it was just a striking battle, I actually think Sterling won the striking battle. Like, if it, whenever it was going strike for strike, he won. But whenever he had to get out of the way of a punch or whenever he didn't feel comfortable in the pocket, he would leap back like six, seven feet and start circling away and moving. And it's just like you could have stepped, like taken half a step back and you would have been out of punching range 
why are you jumping back seven feet? Like, yeah. He wastes so much energy with his movement style. And then he's also using a ton of energy to kick. Kicking is really energy intensive, especially the way he throws kicks, where he's throwing these big power, like weird, funky head kicks and body kicks and stuff like that. It's not like he's just eat, chewing up the legs and going for a really um, snappy kicking game that doesn't consume a lot of energy. He's doing stuff where he's really throwing his whole body into it. And the, you know, to get with the footwork thing, you watch him move around and because he's always taking these huge sweeping movements when he doesn't have to, he throws himself off balance a lot. Mm -hmm. And I know at least the second takedown Caraway hit on him. I think it was mostly because Sterling tried to jump back and ended up against the fence, tried to circle out, lost his balance. Caraway just went in on him and Sterling was already off balance. Like he had no way to defend a pretty basic takedown because he was out of position. He was out of position. Yep. And his like his lack of footwork to me is a bigger it, it's the biggest issue that he has is that his footwork is just he's constantly putting himself off balance with it and it's a mess. And it could be one of those things where like, you know, he could be going the Edson Barboza route where the holes that are in Edson Barboza's game have never really changed. It's just that over time, he's gotten better and better and better at masking them. Mm -hmm. so this could be a problem for Sterling for like the next four years. And he just gets slowly better and better and better at covering for it. Um, but it do that does present a worry. Like it, it, at the elite level, especially you know, with some of the guys like Dillashaw and Cruz and potentially even, um, you know, guys like Rafael Suntau up there. Like if, if Sterling, you know, he, he may not be able to crack the elite level. It seemed like he was heading for, for quite a while until that clicks mm -hmm. until he can solve that. It could be one of those things where, Kind of like we saw with Edson Barboza, where he ran up the division at lightweight, and everybody's like, oh my god, Edson Barboza is the truth. The man is the future. And then he got beat by Jamie Varner, and then it was like this two- or three-year curve afterward where he slowly, and suddenly now he's like ranked fifth, and it's just like, now he's this, he beats Anthony Pettis, and he's this really incredible, complete fighter. But it took all this time for those problems that Jamie Varner exposed and that other fighters were able to find over and over again to slowly go away, be nullified. Yeah. So I, I have to admit, I'm I'm a little worried with that about that with Sterling because these are the same problems that we've seen when he started his UFC career. These are the exact same big issues where it's like, well, I think, you know, is his boxing going to be there this time? Maybe. I think it is. We, it seems like he's been working on it and it's still not. It's still, you know, the, I remember like one moment where he threw punches in that fight early and it was head on line, backing straight up, just swinging his arms. And I was like, oh God, that's, that still looks like a fighter who does not want to box ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, just, it, it, for his style of like, or like for his, the way he looks throwing punches and the way he looks when he kind of closes in the pocket, I think it's going to be a while because building comfort in the pocket is not something that comes quickly. And I haven't yeah. done a lot of boxing and I never really gained that comfort in the pocket, but I know it, it, it like even to start thinking like, all right, I, I need to actually start trying to feel comfortable here. And for that to have any sort of effect, it takes a while and it takes getting hit a lot. For yeah. you to like really get comfortable there. And, you know, he's been fighting for what? Like he's been fighting like amateurs about six years so, since his amateur career. But it's something that made, as you pointed out, like I feel like strikers or especially the striking game is the one that takes the longest to develop. Um, there's so many moving pieces. Um, and at all times the opponent is, can be uncooperative in ways that, is a lot more difficult to handle than grappling, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Like, just because you're dealing with so many more factors. 
Um, and that the result is it takes a longer time to learn. Uh, and it takes a longer time to become really efficient at it, especially if you didn't start doing it like really well until like, I, 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 I wouldn't know when he really started training. Uh, when, has he always been with Sarah Longo? He was a team bomb no, squad. No, he started with bomb squad. He started at the same gym John, John Jones started at. Yeah. He went to Sarah Longo not long before his UFC debut, I believe. He may have even debuted at a bomb squad, but I think like his, I think his time in Sarah Longo was pretty coincidental with his time, with his entry to the UFC. Yeah, so it's one of those things that I'm willing to give it more time. Not yeah. jumping off the train on Aljamain Sterling. He, I mean, this also, to a certain extent, he had a lot of success in the first round. Yeah. Ryan Caraway dealt with it. Then Caraway came back, and you saw Aljamain Sterling just run. It was the, it's the he ran out of ideas. He wasn't mm-hmm. sure what to do when his A game wasn't working. Um, and, like, you know, his, his range kicking game wasn't working. His takedowns weren't working. He wasn't able to submit them on the ground. And at that point, he's falling back on facets of his game that aren't developed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, it's – And, and uh, uh, listen, Sterling's a smart guy. He's already out there saying that he needs to change the stuff around. So, yeah. you know, I, I have full faith that he's going to come back and look better possibly later this year or, you know, early next year. The, the big thing is, I think, with him and with any prospect to remember with a guy like him is that, you know, I may say like, oh, I think it's going to take a long time. I worry how he's going to do against other elite competition and it may be this roadblock for him up against the elite. But with the athletic tools and the technical tools that he has, uh, being an exceptionally gifted wrestler and very good grappler, uh, yeah. very good top grappler at least, um, he is not. He's ne- like he's going to get there eventually, unless something just goes dramatically wrong. Like he gets addicted to drugs dramatically wrong. Because we already like. I'm not worried about his ability to take a punch or something like that. It doesn't seem like he's got a bad chin or anything. Um, and most of the time when you get a very good athlete who has got a deep technical skill base in at least one area, they tend to get there. Like Mm -hmm. whether it takes a little longer than you thought or not. Like, I mean, even, even, even Robbie Lawler who, you know, Everybody was like, he's, ne- you know, he's kind of a bust. He's never going to get there. And it took him forever. And eventually the fact that he's a really elite athlete who built a very deep tech, who started as a wrestler and built a very good, solid technical striking base, he got there in the end. Like, yeah. the road's almost always tend to lead to the top if you have the athletic tools and the technical tools. So, yeah, and, and if you stick with it and if, you, if you're learning from good people, there's going to be opportunities because this isn't that big of a sport. No. So I'm not, I'm not worried that he can't win every, two out of every three or three out of every four fights in the UFC until everything really clicks. But I do think this uh, Caraway fight does – for now, it shows that there's a ceiling there. You know, it shows that he's run up against not just a bad style matchup, but a certain level of fighter that he's going to struggle with because he's not getting some. He, he's not guys he can't get a submission against or can't get takedowns against, and who aren't then afraid of his striking game at all. Yeah. So. It was. It's an interesting fight for him, and uh, you know, it, it was a big, definitely a notable setback on this card. Uh, more so, I mean, I don't know about more so than Thomas Almeida, but it, it definitely felt like he, because he got to see it over two full rounds of him struggling. It felt like a much more complete examination of a problem. Yeah. So otherwise, there aren't really there weren't really a lot of prospects on this card um yeah, that, that, that that pretty much covers like i mean oh, adam milstead looked pretty good he beat the, adam milstead looked solid he's he he's tough enough of, which is a big thing because he definitely took some shots in that de la roca fight but 
he is tough enough to take the shots and he stands in and he hits enough power and consistency to get a weird stoppage, but a good solid one. I'm glad that it didn't end up I'm glad he didn't end up with him getting knocked out by something fluky after beating on De La Roca for a Roca for a round. That yeah. would have been really depressing to me to like watch him just wail on De La Roca for all of the second round and then like get knocked out in the third when he's gassed out or something and be like, Oh, there's the yeah. uh the the Todd Duffy effect. Yeah. But if we're talking about, hey, Sarah McMahon won her, like, actually won her second fight in the UFC. Third. Like, I, mean, I know, the Lauren Murphy. Oh, but yeah, but like, the Lauren Murphy fight. But, yeah. like, actually won her uh, yeah. second fight in the UFC. So. And she's, she's not young, but she started, but she hasn't been in the sport that long. So there's there's hope for her making another run yet. Yeah, again, small division. She'll probably be around for a while, but she... Yeah. She looked that, fine. I actually thought she looked better than ever in that fight. I thought that well, that... I mean, yeah, but... Her connection between her wrestling and her ground striking was the best it had ever looked. Yes, and for her, I agree that. Because it's... I thought the problem for her has been that not only does she not have a clean transition from striking to wrestling necessarily, but that she doesn't when she gets somebody down she doesn't do anything she just waits them out yeah so for her to actually just jump on eye and punch her whenever she got the opportunity was a That's really tough. nice refreshing change yeah even if it was a terrible fight and it was a terrible fight it was bad it was really bad and uh paul felder did pretty well to uh rally back against Josh Berkman. I think kind of like what I was saying with uh, Sterling Felder is a guy who has had some problems exposed and those problems don't seem to be going away. Yeah. But he's maybe starting to get a little bit better at coping with them. Mm -hmm. Because early in that fight, Berkman was kind of piecing Felder up just by being, staying aggressive and throwing in combination and, you know, staying active and moving well in the pocket things that Felder really tends to struggle against and um a Berkman just couldn't keep it up that well but yeah. uh not shocking I mean yeah Tom I'll do this been fighting for what 13 years yeah like, but Felder looks like he's doing a decent a better job than before of trying to adjust yeah. and find the moments to land big damaging shots in those exchanges agreed well, we got some good stuff coming up this week. Uh, yeah. So, well, before we jump to that, though, we want to talk a little bit too about some of the backlash that's been that's oh, gone out man. there for Thomas Almeida and Aljamain Sterling because that's been kind of the secondary story of this card. MMA fans love to jump on a prospect when they lose. Like, there's a big portion of MMA fans that just absolutely. As soon as a prospect loses, they just start. I mean, you get overhyped in all caps coming <laughs> from everywhere. And they I mean, all knew it, apparently. Yeah, of course. That's the other part. I mean, <sighs> the weird thing is, is, like, I don't know if I took, if you went out and took a poll of, like, a hundred different MMA fans of – and even like hardcore fans or like MMA writers mm -hmm. of the 10 best prospects in the UFC, you would probably end up with like 800 different names. Well, there aren't 800 fighters in the UFC, but it just, it seems like there's just very little consensus on what makes someone a prospect in this sport. And that's partially because what it means to be a prospect is so diverse. There are so many different paths toward success at the, the top level. Athletically, ta skill wise, there are all these different things people are looking for. But because of that, it just seems like every there's a huge willingness to just write off anybody that doesn't look like what a fan think, whatever that particular fan thinks a prospect should look like. Yeah. 
And it's really, I don't know, it's really hard to cut through that for guys. And it seems, I, I don't want to say it's a race issue, but it definitely seems like... Uh, there's a nationalistic issue to it. There's a nationalistic issue, but it also just feels like, I don't know, guys that are not white get less leeway. Like, the moment they fail... There seems to be a much heavier like ah oh, I knew that guy was all hype all along. Sage Northcutt. Sage Northcutt. I I don't know his backlash wasn't. I, some of it was bad, but was I bad. feel like a lot it of it was wasn't. Like yeah, I, I think it's more. I, I think more of just like I, I, there's this weird mix of fans seem to resent like anyone coming up like and getting press. Like if any fighter starts getting significant press on their way up, like there's this fe- there's there's like this feeling amongst fans that you have to pay your dues before you can get like big. I remember this really strongly when like Connor was on his way up, like really early on. Connor, like the yeah. first two three fights in the UFC, and I wrote, I wrote an article on his guard passing because I was just watching the thing and I just like oh. Like, I know that pass he's doing really well. I'm going to write an article on it. And I got, like, flooded with, like, why are you writing this about some guy who, like, you know, he doesn't matter. Like, people are just like, oh, what are you're just You're just doing it because the UFC is pushing him. Like, and this idea that, uh, again, this idea that there's this idea that the media leads the fans into what fighters they should like instead of the fact that, like, for the most part, the, to, to pull back the curtain, we – when people are writing articles about stuff, they follow the trend of what the fans like. It's the, yeah. there's not like this mass plan to there's not this mass plan to like influence the fans to like certain fighters. It's really like, you know, when you're looking at content, it's like, all right, what fighters are the fans interested in? And I think Con- there's Conor like McGregor seems like too. the rare dude, I will say, that really got hated on the way up. Like he, he got hated not for like it wasn't like people didn't jump on to hate when he lost, although they have now, because he brought he really brings it upon himself. But they really jumped on to hate while he was winning, you know. Yeah, yeah, he, no. He, um, there's there's a turning point. I feel like there's a turning point where like fighters fun when they're like on the undercard, and then as soon as they start getting featured, there's this like there's this turnover, even if they're winning, then it's like, well, they're just getting good matchmaking or, well, they haven't fought this guy or that guy or this kind of style or, and it, it's just really interesting. I think like for the most part, I think fans kind of, as you said, they have their own personal conception of like this prospect is the guy. And then for some reason they resent anyone else being named yeah. like a good prospect. And there's like the zero sum game attitude. Like, no, only my guy can be a prospect and everyone else has to be dog shit. It's true. It, it, it that's the biggest part is that it just seems everybody gets really it singularly focused on a sing, a fighter that they are into, and any other fighter that gets hype, but the fighter they love is despised immediately, and it it creates this weird backlash where like yeah, suddenly people are like really happy that Aljamain Sterling lost, or really happy that Thomas Almeida lost. And it's just like, well, why? Like, why would you care? Why? We're just we're just living in the byproduct that the UFC the, or the MMA community is primarily an online community. Like for the most part, you know, you, you don't have a lot of people that you can talk to in real life about MMA. Even I, like I train in martial arts. I'm at the gym all the time, and like maybe two or three other guys follow MMA as closely as I do and want to talk about it. So, like for the most yeah. part, we're 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 uh, suffering all the pitfalls of online discourse. Also, this is true. This is true. the The only opinions that people want to make online are their loudest and worst ones. So, yeah, well, and also any argument on a line gets turned into two extremes. So it's like I can't have a prospect that I like, and you have a prospect that you like. At some point, it's going to be me telling you, me you that your guy's shit and my guy's the truth. Yeah, because that's just how internet conversations go. And then at some point, someone invokes Hitler. Well, that the Hitler. Th- I I feel like the Hitler thing has died down, but maybe I just don't spend enough time in the right circles. Yeah, that's true. So, um, so on that note, 
now that we've invoked Hitler. Tom Breeze or Brian Ortega? Which one is your boy? Breeze. Yeah. yeah. It, like, I know. No, no question. We're, so we're, we're headed to UFC 199 now. And of all the fighters on this card, well, Max Holloway, I'll admit, he's 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 still at, like, the... Cusp? The bare yeah, I don't really... I can't really consider him a prospect anymore, even if he's only 24, because he's already highly ranked and on the path towards a title shot. So it's hard for me to be like, oh, that young prospect, Max Holloway. But, you know, if it's guys that are really on the way up, Tom Breeze is the one. Yeah, yeah. I think um, Breeze has – all right, so a lot of people – we talked about this last time. A lot of people jumped on Breeze. Or last time Breeze fought, we talked about this, like, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. A lot of people jumped on him for the fight. Uh, his last fight, who, which was against Taito Nakamura. Yep, tough veteran. Nakamura uh, took it to him a little bit. They had a good contested fight. Thought Breeze won pretty clearly. Uh, even yep. uh, he got a unanimous decision. It was a good fight for him. He struggled, yep. and that's okay for prospects to struggle. I think um, this fight is another like really tough fight. Like Strickland's a really hard guy to get out of there. He's really tough to finish. Uh, in mm. the sense that he's only lost once, and it was uh, he doesn't get hurt very often. He's already beaten uh, like a like physical specimen, Alex Garcia. Like Strickland weathered the storm and took over that fight. I think this is a really like this is going to be a really competitive matchup for Breeze. Like this is a like serious. Where are you at? If you win this fight, we're giving you some serious names after this sort of fight. If he loses, not a big deal. He goes back. This is like the, a really tough veteran matchup for him. He goes back, tinkers with his game. Strickland's strikings looked really good. He's been adding in uh, sneaky leg locks into his ground game uh, that he kind of busted out against Nakamura because Breeze has been hanging out with like the Dan Danaher Death Squad guys uh, and really um, sharpening up his leg locks. So maybe we see some of that. But I'm all on board the Tom Breeze train. Yeah, Bre I will say this: Strickland has a bit of that James Vick feel to him, mm -hmm. where like he's not the offensive. Uh, I don't know, complete like o overwhelmingly o overwhelming offensive aggressor that Vick can be. But Strickland, ha you know, he's also he's pretty big, six foot one at one hundred and seventy pounds. And has, a, has a knack for beating dudes on the rise. Yeah, he's big. He's tough. He's also young, um, although he's fought for a long time now. And he has, like, the biggest problem for Breeze in this fight is that Strickland has a tendency to be a defense-first, safety-first fighter. Mm -hmm. So he really stays out at range. He'll throw out a few jabs. And he just kind of, he really waits for an opponent to come in and engage with him. Yep. So for Breeze, it's going to be like, can he create offense against that kind of opponent without putting himself in danger? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think he can, but it'll it'll be an interesting contest because Strickland is also, you know, a pretty good, strong grappler, very mm -hmm. good, uh, not, not, the be not necessarily as good a wrestler as he is a grappler, but... I think I don't expect Breeze to be able to get a submission, and if Breeze goes to the ground, he may find himself working really hard to maintain control. And a lot of this could just be a really slow, kind of simmering fight on the feet, and it'll come down to whether or not Breeze can create enough offense there to beat Strickland. Yeah, so this yeah. could be an, it. Could be a very tough fight. This is the fight I'm probably like of. Uh like one of the m fights I'm looking forward to the most on this. Cause I think it's going to be really competitive in a fight in, in a card of what should be a large number of just like execution fights. Um, <laughs> this one, this one could be pretty damn competitive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. Uh, also on this card. So obviously up at the top, we got Max Holloway fighting Ricardo Lamas. This is just, should be a good fight, but I'm, I'm, fight. I'm thinking Max Holloway takes this because Lamas has a tendency to just kind of sit around and wait for his opponent to get hurt. 
it it'll be it, this will be a good test for Holloway because Lamas's big thing is that yeah he tends to well Lamas is such an opportunist it's not so much that you know Lamas can be easily losing a fight and then he'll stun you with a random jab or counter hook or something or he'll get a takedown and suddenly jump on you with some hugely powerful ground and pound or you'll go in for a sloppy takedown he'll jump on a guillotine or something like that and so it's a good it's a good fight for Holloway in that he really has to be offensively productive and mm-hmm. controlled he ha- you know it's more so- it's a kind of fight that his Charles Oliveira fight could have been had Oliveira not gone down to a neck injury and with Lamas generally being a much more you know, not the same grappling threat, but a, a much more diverse threat than Oliveira at times. Yeah. So it should be an interesting fight for Holloway. I think he's arrived well enough that, yeah, I agree that he should take it. But I've thought a lot of people could beat Ricardo Lamas, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's he's tough and he's a good fighter. So I'm looking forward to that one. Um um, Brian Ortega, Clay Guida. I think. I think. I think that's Ortega's fight all the way, for the most part. Yeah, like, because I, I think this is kind of weird because Ortega is really not very good, but this is probably the yeah. best matchup he can get to bring him up into the like to keep his rise on the t- into the top fifteen. Yeah, like he's a very very good grappler and a very very a poor striker. <laughs> he's a very good grappler and that's not a, nothing kinda, else that's kind of it <laughs> no, he's a very um, good grappler and he's facing someone who will only wrestle with him yeah, and that's, that, that's, and that's as good as it gets for him pretty much yeah that's I think that's that's pretty much it and Clay Guida who while an aggressive wrestler and an aggressive mat worker has never been super technical at either of those things has usually relied on being really physical in those phases to just like overwhelm guys. And I don't think that's going to work here. Um, and it's, it's really, uh, was this, well, I, I'm trying to remember, is this a, let me look at the fight card real quick on tapology. Is this a, did this fight fall out? Was there supposed to be someone else in there against Ortega or did nope. they just really oh, softball him? Uh, it looks like they just softball been- him. I, I think, well, I don't even know that it's, yeah, like, yeah, I don't even know that I would call it softballing. It, he's just getting a veteran with some name value because a lot of the fighters above him are booked or something. But, but yeah, yeah, it's it's good matchmaking for him. Um, I'm not against it because yeah. I'm always but- happy to see more new blood at the top. Guys like Dennis Seaver and Clay Guida have kind of hung, ar- hung around up there well past their prime because they've tended not to get matched up with. Stop, uh, guys! Like, yeah, I mean, he he pulled out the win against Diego Brandao, and I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, um, Brandao was pretty soundly winning that fight on the feet. Oh yeah, and Brandao this has, was, was beating him for three rounds before. This was on its way to being the fight where you look at Brian Ortega and be like, all right, so like he has been playing a game that is against the meta game of MMA, like a really submission oriented grappling game with very little other skills and like. He's a throwback fighter, and it's fun, but this is where the fun stops. And then he pulled out a miracle triangle choke, which was awesome. It was like a really nice triangle choke. Yeah. I, I was. It, it, it would be a miracle if it wasn't Diego Brando. Yeah. It, against it, Diego Brando, it's just the sort of – I, I, I remember I picked Brian Ortega in that fight because – and my, my thought was that Diego Brando will win almost every moment of this fight and then do something dumb and fluky and lose. Because it's Diego Brando. He, he, is, yeah. he is the master at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. But, yeah, he's um, got that uh, Max Murderer thing. Maxi, uh, oh, what's his name? God damn, Maximo Blanco. Yeah, so he's, this is not the fight where Brian Ortega, I mean, unless Clay Guida, like, just somehow manages to press him into the fence, but Ortega will just pull guard. Like, yeah. um, this is not the fight where, where the, like, common... The, the common ways to win an MMA fight catch up with Brian Ortega and then like the, the, the numbers average out. It's going to happen eventually. I, I think it, it, there's going to be a hard wall with Ortega. Um, 
Sure, he'll fight somebody maybe, you know, it, I mean, it could even be somebody like Charles Oliveira who could hang with him pretty well on the ground and then who's just a much better, more consistent striker. Yeah. Yeah, or like, yeah, it, it will be... It, it, when it happens, it'll be it'll be a really hard wall he runs into. It, it could easily be, but Guida won't be. Guida's been submitted like twelve times in his career. It this doesn't feel like it, no, it doesn't feel like he's going to have. He's not going to get a submission here. Yeah. Otherwise, on this card, uh, no, we got a weird light heavyweight fight between Jonathan Wilson and Luis Henrique da Silva. Yeah, it's gonna be. Um... Wilson is one of those guys that, like, in his one UFC fight and, like, all seven seconds of it, he looked pretty good. And then mm-hmm. basically, and we, we talked about this before the show earlier today, this is basically his only professional fight because he came yep. up in Gladiator and explode. So that's bullshit. So he's a good athlete and has good power. And then other than that, it's really hard to assess his skills because he was fighting dudes that were, like, just throwing jump kicks at him, and yeah, just, like he, yeah. he he was fighting O and O or like one in twelve dudes, and, yeah. and then and, jumping to the UFC. Uh but the the thing is, is that you know what makes it kind of a weird fight to me is that his opponent Louis Frankenstein, not very good. No. No, I'm I'm okay. I'm glad we're on the same page on this because I come in like so. He's big for the division. At best, I'd say he's an average athlete, and he's slow. <laughs> he's not even that big. I think you might be th- thought he think he's bigger than he is because he's fighting Ildemar Alcantara, who's who is a middleweight. He's listed at six foot two oh five. Oh man! Oh, you know what? I for some reason because he was fighting Alcantara, thought he was a middleweight, and I'm like, Jesus, he's six four for a middleweight, and it never clicked. Yeah, no. So he's not even that big. He's he's not a very good athlete. Um, he's he's slow. Um, he's tough yeah. as hell, and he throws some really heavy kicks, but he doesn't do it very well. He throws some pretty heavy punches, but he doesn't do it very well, and yeah. he gets hit really easily. Defensively, he's an okay grappler, so he's got that. I, I'm I'm interested to see what happens to Johnny Wilson or to John Wilson, Jonathan Wilson, over his UFC career. If he can be molded from like basically nothing in that light heavyweight division that is so terrible, they they seem to be like they're matching him right now in a way that seems like they want to develop him. Like yeah. the Chris Dempsey fight was a soft touch, and um, Dempsey seemed like he was just physically totally overwhelmed in that fight in that short fight um well De- like, dempsey couldn't take a punch either like well, as we, was, we saw throughout his UFC career there was just yeah no he can't take a punch and then and then there was just a moment where like wilson pinned him against the fence and then like put a hand in his bicep to like just control one of dempsey's arms so he wouldn't push it and you saw dempsey try to circle it out couldn't move his arm, try to circle out, couldn't move his arm, goes to arm drag Wilson, can't move his arm, and you just see this moment of panic, like, holy shit, I can't move this man's arm, what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, I can't even I can't even break a grip up, like, break a grip, how the fuck am I supposed to beat this man? De- Dempsey is a natural middleweight who doesn't take shots well and is not terribly athletic. His time in the UFC was always kind of a mystery. Yeah. Um, so, at that point, there's not a lot else to talk about on this card. Um, uh, Benil Dariush is back in the cage. Oh, oh that's right, Benil Dariush and James Vick. I, I still don't really, I don't really consider Dariush a prospect at this point because he's been fighting since 2009. But yeah. James Vick certainly is, and Dariush can certainly grow, continue to grow. He's yeah, just he. I, I, I think he, he he effed up pretty bad in the Michael Chiesa fight. Like, I I really feel like he kind of went in there like, oh, I'm this. You know, I'm I'm the jujitsu guy here. He's just some good dude who takes people's backs and puts in chokes. Like I don't have to worry. And he continually exposed his back with uh, if I remember correctly, he kept trying to throw Chiesa and yeah. continually exposed his back, just showed like utter contempt for Chiesa's best aspect, and then seemed to be in total shock when Chiesa crushed his face with a rear naked choke grip. Yeah, it's kind of weird too to me because you know obviously he came Darius came up uh, 
you know, he, he got a submission over Charlie Brenneman and a submission over Tony Martin and a submission over Darren Crookshank, who, when you actually think about that list, are three eminently submittable dudes. <laughs> yeah. Like, they're three very submission-prone opponents. And since then, his submission often, even when he's won, his submission, like, his his submission game and his wrestling game haven't really... It's not so much, like, for him, it's really more of his control on the map that is usually yeah. the more impressive thing. But, yeah, he doesn't really... He's not really good at getting it to the mat. Like, the Michael Johnson fight really... Um, really kind of displayed that. But he, he's got... He's got really good passing and really good control on the yeah. ground. And then he likes... Yeah, he likes to get to the back and finish or make a choke if possible. It, it, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, it doesn't feel like... Sudden, it, it doesn't feel like, as a guy who came up with this really impressive jujitsu game and who came up with these submissions that that part of his game has continued to be a controlling factor as he's moved up against better opponents. Yeah, and that's that's pretty normal because you're getting in there against guys like, you know, Jim Miller, who's been, like, who's been a black belt. Yeah. Like, you know, for all of Jim Miller's fault, he's been a black belt in jiu-jitsu, like, as long as Benil Darius has been fighting professionally. Like, longer, I, I think. So, like, you're going up against really experienced guys. Yeah, I, I don't expect, but it's it's interesting. Like then, you know, he gets this Kiesa fight, and it suddenly, to me, it feels a bit like something can't, comes to a head. Where it's suddenly like, I mean, are you the jujitsu dude? Like, it, it, <laughs> yeah. When push yeah. comes to shove, and you face another elite guy with good submission offense, you're the one getting subbed. Like, yeah. It's like, oh well, and I think I think part of it too is this idea that like. You know, and I need to go back and watch some of Benil's grappling matches. But if I recall correctly, I mean, like he was, you know, there. It's not a great big secret that in a lot of jujitsu matches there aren't like these long, prolonged takedown battles. Yeah. But grappling, like especially like the first fifteen seconds after a takedown, is different than like when you're just trying to like start from the knees and someone like lays back to guard. Then they like, you just, they set up their guard and you go to pass. There's like a fifteen second like moment or like window after a takedown where grappling is just flat out different. And um, jujitsu guys don't always thrive in that, in that if they're not very comfortable with that. And I think against, if I'm remembering it, she hasn't got his back again after a failed throw. And I yeah. kind of one of those things that I'm wondering if that like the uh, standing the ground transition or what some people call like the cover, like after the throw or the failed throw, like, you, you run for cover if you're the bottom guy. Like, a lot of jujitsu you guys don't always have that. And I'm wondering if that's that's something that Darius, like, maybe needs to develop more um, if he wants to be as an effective grappler. Because in, like, set-piece grappling exchanges, like, when he gets a guy down and then, like, lays in their guard for a few seconds and, like, sets up what he wants to do, he's brilliant. But, yeah, um, yeah it's one of those, like, the transition-y, scrambly takedown moments he doesn't seem as comfortable in. I'm interested to see this fight with James Vick, frankly, because uh, Vick, you know, has a lot of offensive and has a lot of offensive and defensive defensive holes for a fighter like Darius to cut through. But also, I mean, in that Ramsey Nijam sort of way, has this completely awkward, aggressive power about him that. Like, I think it's time for Darius to face that kind of test again after this loss and be like, can you actually go out there and get a good control, good dominant win over somebody that's big enough and tough enough to be here and not technically deep enough? Yeah. All right. Well, because a lot of people haven't been able to do that with Vic at all. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, oh, also worth knowing, Jessica Andrade is making her, uh, Strawweight debut on this card against yeah, Jessica Penne. That should be fun. Yeah, and I'm interested to see what Andrade can do. She's still got room to learn. She's got a lot of aggression. She still needs to figure out how to channel effectively. <laughs> I thought you should say like work out. Like she's got to work out some aggression issues. No, she needs to figure out how and when and where to use her aggression. Uh, yeah. I'll be interested to see what she can do at 115 if she's really just like this freakishly powerful uh, brawler at that mm -hmm. weight. Um, because obviously it was something that she kept running up against at Bantamweight was that, you know, she's a powerful brawler who would then meet a bunch of people she couldn't muscle around. And 
if she wasn't getting knockouts, and she rarely ever was, um, because she wasn't a very accurate, consistent puncher, then she would end up getting pushed around or taken down or outworked by much less, uh, not necessarily as athletic or uh, technical fighters, but mm -hmm. just... So I'm interested to see what she'll do at 115. At this point, I want to take a quick jump into the regional scene before we close up the show because there are a few. Yeah, I, I got to start with ACB. Like they have a, just a sick card this weekend, just stacked. Yeah, there are three big shows this weekend for prospects. Um, ACB is a big one. They've got a few guys that we've, a uh, couple fighters we've scouted, Abdul Rahman Janayev and Alexander Pettison, who are both great, great striking prospects. And also, and Pettison's just a really well-rounded fighter. They're both pretty well-rounded fighters, but Pettison really co has come up with that sort of MMA me metagame approach where he's always attacking in the in-between spaces and mm -hmm. you know wrestles and grapples aggressively as well as striking aggressively and really does everything well. John Iev obviously is an amateur MMA can uh, champ on the Russian circuit. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Yusuf Rysov, who, who is probably one of the best five prospects in MMA right now. Yeah, he he uh, he took over the Boar's nickname, right? Yes, he did. He, he yeah, did. So, if that flow grappling list ever comes out, they, I gave to them a while ago, and they're still not publishing it. But hey, um, he he's in my top five. He's a fantastic, fantastic athlete. Really good fighter. Um, yeah, incredibly and, powerful striker. Took with Adlan Amagov's br uh, blessing has taken over the Boar's nickname, which is all you need to know. Yeah, and then um, uh, Batayev is on this one too. Yeah who is another really good young striker. Yeah, we saw him I, we saw him on an ACB card not long ago and discovered 30, him there. Was it, yeah, I think it was 31. Let me check. It was it was whatever the la his yeah. last fight was. 31. ACB yeah. 31. Yeah, I remember it was it got around really quick cuz he he absolutely blitzed Marcos Vince uh Vincinius and just like people were getting like did yep. you see this? Yeah. 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 That was a good, he he really looked great in that fight against a, a long standing veteran who's got UFC level experience. I'm really excited to see Badaev as well. Uh, the other two cards there's the RFA card in the States, which has got uh, Tiago Moises versus Jamal Emmers is a really solid prospect fight, Mario Israel versus Albo, Albert Morales, mm -hmm. and uh, Jose Diaz, Jose, uh, uh, Jose, rather, I'm faced to the fucking bazillions but uh jose diaz versus nick barnes mm -hmm. and uh, also chris padilla on that car like there's just a bunch of good solid uh brazilian and american fighters working their way up the, in rfa and rfa is obviously a major jump off point to the ufc so you know that if you see guys doing well there they're you're likely to see them yeah and the other card that really uh honestly caught my eye this weekend, just from a concentrated uh, talent standpoint, is Scandinavia Fight Nights. Yeah. Which they have David Tamer's brother, Daniel Tamer. David Tamer being a recent UFC call-up uh, who looked pretty good in his UFC debut. And a uh, guy, Sa Sadabu Sai, who I would love to see, uh, if not in the UFC, in Bellator at some point, because he's a kickboxer who is making making inroads into mma great athlete nice flashy style fun powerful fighter and it just feels like exactly the right the right fit for the kind of thing bellator is doing these days especially with their joint kickboxing idea and stuff like that mm -hmm. um so i'm excited to see him uh i've got another couple guys amir albazi and muhammad babadi babadavand who i'm <laughs> interested in seeing and you know so it looks like a solid card with a lot of interesting fighters on it uh, a couple other fighters i'm really interested in from around the circuit gregor gillespie on ring of combat yeah ring of combat gregor gillespie is fighting he did what i don't know when his contract comes up but he's got to be moments away from getting a call to the ufc like there's absolutely nothing that he should be staying outside the UFC for at this point. Uh, 
Justin Scoggins, little brother Jared Scoggins, who's also a flyweight, is fighting this weekend. Very similar fighter, similar looking, similar style, same weight class, flyweight. Mm -hmm. Something to watch out for. Um, Ian Martell is coming back. Yeah. Fighting in the UK card for contenders. One of our top light heavyweight prospects. He's been out for a couple of years. I, I think it seemed like he was pursuing a boxing career br briefly, but I don't know that anything ever came of it. And now it appears he's coming back to MMA. He's got a fight coming up. So I'm very excited to see Martel fight again. Really big, powerful, strong athlete, solid boxer, knows how to wrestle, knows how to play a top game. Really rare specimen at light heavyweight who just does not seem like he's taken the approach his approach to improving in the sport that seriously so that's kind of the downside there like he's just kind of screwing around with it also cage warriors is coming back uh most notably on that card, i'm looking forward to seeing the hobbit sam creasy fight <laughs> and uh also just down in brazil there's bravos combat uh gustavo gabriel and nce with uh I'm just going to throw this out. Thadi Bergamashi, uh, a woman's MMA fighter who's doing pretty well down there. Always good to watch Watch out for fighters like her because obviously the UFC divisions are thin and they always need new talent. So it's always good to keep an eye on fighters that are doing well in the Brazilian regional scene. Gustavo Gabriel is a young kid with a nice Muay Thai game. Interested to see what he can do down there. And, uh, you know, we'll have a list, obviously, of a few other people that are kicking around on the regional scene this weekend. But those are all the big people or big ones I want to touch on. Uh, so plenty to watch if you're looking beyond the UFC card. On that note, I think that's it for the show this week. Thanks for joining me, Tom. You can find me on Twitter at these same time. You can find Tom on Twitter at TP underscore Grant. You can find both of us at Bloody Elbow in our various capacities or times. Uh, you can... Give this video a like. That's a thumbs up. That helps us a ton. Subscribe to MMANation.com, D-O-T-C-O-M, over on YouTube. It's where you get all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, videos, interviews, all that good stuff. And thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.